Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at Save Your Community History, Family and Community Archiving Basics. It's wonderful to see so many folks arriving. Um, so my name is Kimberly McKee. I'm the director of the Coochie Office of Local History at Grand Valley State University. The Coochie Office is housed in the Brooks College of Interdisciplinary Studies. Our mission is to give voice to diverse communities through history. I'm really excited um, to have both Lee Rupinski and Annie Benefield here with us to go over family and community archiving basics. And so um, I'm, before I introduce them and turn it over to them, I'm going to read their bios. Lee Rupinski is the Archivist for Public Services and Community Engagement and the History Department Liaison Librarian at Grand Valley State University. She earned her Master's in Science of Information from the University of Michigan School of Information and her Bachelor's Degree in English from Grand Valley State University. Prior to coming to GVSU, she worked as a loan arranger at Wilson College in Chambersburg, PA, and as a digitization assistant at the University of Michigan's Digital Conversion Unit. Her areas of interest include primary source instruction, innovative outreach, and the role of storytelling in archival collections. Annie Benefield is the University Archivist and Digital Collections Librarian at GVSU. She has been working in university archives and special collections since her undergraduate days and earned a master's in library and information science with a concentration in archives management from Sinmans University in 2011. At Grand Valley State University, she is responsible for collecting, organizing, preserving, digitizing, and sharing archival materials of all types. In her spare time, she enjoys hanging out with her spouse and cat, Dungeons and Dragons, video games, and dabbling in new hobbies. I've had the experience to work both with Lee and Annie through my work through the Coochie Office, so it's my pleasure to have them be able to present sort of their expertise to all of you. So please give me a please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lee and Annie. Hi. All right, let's get started. Hopefully everyone can see my screen here. Here we go. All right. Um, as Kim said, I am Lee Rupinski and Annie Benefield is my colleague. We're going to sort of take this presentation in two parts. So I'll be speaking first and then Annie is going to uh, bring it all home uh, for us. If you have questions, please feel free um, to use the Q&A function uh, at the options at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also uh, use chat if you have difficulty with that Q&A. All right, here's just a really basic roadmap of where we're going in today's presentation. I do wanna um, say it is packed full. We have timed it a couple times and barely made it through uh, in our allotted hour. So uh, we will take questions at the end. We won't pause during the presentation for those um, just so that we make sure to get through all of our material. All right, we're going to start with uh, talking about collecting, selecting um, what to save and what not to save from the materials that you hopefully already have or have decided that you want to start collecting. So if you already have materials, we want to talk about how you might uh, weed them down, how to, to, to make decisions about saving or getting rid of things. That is something archivists do. Uh, and then talking about how to identify gaps uh, as well. What might you want to add to the collection? So to get started, I want us to be on the same page about what archives are when we're discussing them. Uh, and so this is the standard archives definition from the Society of American Archivists. Archives are records created or received by a person, family, or organization and preserved because of their continuing value. And the definition is, of course, kind of intentionally a little bit vague, but there's emphasis on this idea of uh, continuing value. So a lot of people think because archivists are collection caretakers, that means we save everything. And this definition very clearly says, no, we don't. We're making a judgment call based on this idea of continuing value. Archivists are actually very good at not saving everything. So what I want to get us started talking about is how do we make those judgment calls? How do we decide what has continuing value and what doesn't? So it's really the starting point when you're working with your materials uh, to know what deserves to be saved long term, what is worth my time and effort, because this is a process that takes time and effort and sometimes other um, financial resources too, and what doesn't. Uh, so this could be its own lecture uh, kind of on its own. I'm going to try to just go through this very briefly, but when we're talking about continuing value, we're talking about a lot of different types of value. And the one that you might think of first is financial value, and that's actually usually um, not a type that we consider very heavily in archives. 
um, but it might come up when you're looking at your uh, family materials, you might have pieces of jewelry um, or artwork, a very, very rare edition of a book. Those things have financial value that might impact why you would save them or not save them. Uh, other types of value that you might wanna consider. Uh, legal, legal value, proof of citizenship, your birth certificate, things that prove your business is being run legally. All those kinds of things have value uh, and are reasons that you might save something. In family archives in particular, it could be sentimental value. That's something we don't deal with in academic archives very often. Um, so when I'm talking about that, I'm thinking of like, if you're going through your grandmother's closet and she's got you know this cardigan from Target that she wore every time you guys made cookies together or whatever, you know, special family memory is tied up in this cardigan, you might want to save that because of all the memories you have associated with it, even though it's really just, you know, the $10 uh, Target cardigan doesn't really have a lot of other value. Another type of value could be evidential, proof of an, how an event happened. So think of like letters that document uh, a World War II experience um, or how a business operated, the, you know, all the documents that prove your business um, was successful or who the clientele were or how you got started, all those kinds of things are evidence pieces that we could use to build an argument or a story about the value of your family, organization, event, whatever. Uh, all these types of value can then be assessed and you can use them um, to make judgments about what you wanna save or not save, how highly you value sentiment over evidence over, um, you know, hopefully legal is a really high one for you, but you can make those kinds of decisions. Uh, another factor you can use is policy, particularly if you're in an organization or an institution. Uh, most of them have a collecting policy um, that sort of gives guidelines. We collect things related to the neighborhood between this block and this block. And if it's extended beyond that, we don't collect it. Those kinds of things. If you don't have that kind of policy, now's a good time to write one. Start looking at other organizations that are similar to what you do or what you want to do and start writing those guiding policies because you don't wanna be in competition necessarily with other people either. So like at Grand Valley, we have a collecting policy that differentiates what we collect from what the Grand Rapids Public Museum collects from what the Grand Rapids Public Library collects from what Central Michigan University collects. So we wanna kind of make our own space and have our own valuable collections as opposed to sort of fighting over things with other people. Uh, and then finally, if you don't have a collection policy and you're thinking about making one, uh, or if you're working in a family archive even, document your decisions as you go, why you decided to save something or not save something. And I'm fully aware that this feels really silly if what you're doing is cleaning out great grandma's closet because nobody else wanted to. But they say that now, and then in five years, Aunt Lucy is gonna come breathe down your neck because something grandma owned wasn't kept and she wants to know why you made that decision and you're on the brink of family warfare now. Um, so do try to keep track of why you made decisions or justify the decisions that you did make as you go. It's also a way you can guide if you're a business or you're working in a community archive, you can guide um, agreements between community members. Yes, we will take this thing from you. Uh, and our agreement is that we will take care of it in this way. Do you agree to that or not? Yes, we will take the originals and you or you will keep the originals. Those have different um, meanings and impacts on how your community functions and how much they trust you and all those things. So make sure you're making good documented decisions as you go to help justify um, all the work that you're doing. All right, so then I wanna talk about to save it or not to save it, the big question here. And I'm gonna start with talking about what, what, whoa, what is worth saving? It's my own tongue twister there. Uh, what works for me is to always kind of start with this framework of decision making through the lens of storytelling. That one just really um, resonates easily with me. So I think about does this record tell a story or contribute to a story in some way? Does my story feel richer or more complete because of this item? So uh, thinking about that, if you have one letter that somebody wrote to grandma and you've never met this person and you actually have no idea who they are and the letter is mostly about their life and not grandma's life, it's not super contributing to the story of your family, right? So it's probably not worth saving. But if you have 50 letters from grandma's neighbor uh, who moved across the country and they you know, exchanged letters and discussed their family histories and um, really there's some really rich details in there about what their lives were like, that's telling a story and that's contributing to what grandma's life was like. So we wanna save those. Uh, you can also think about different factors like, is it visually interesting? Um, think about, does it have 
you know, did Aunt Lucy always doodle on her notepads? Are those doodles kind of indicative of her character or the things that she thought? Or, um, you know, do they provide a different kind of value in that way? Is it a photograph that's visually interesting? Or is it one where you can't really tell what's happening or where they are? Um, did someone write in the margins of a book? So oftentimes archives will say like, we don't save textbooks. They get outdated really fast. They're not super useful. But if someone wrote in their textbook who went on to become very important in their field, or they made, you know, even just really, really funny notations uh, that made you laugh, that might have a different kind of visual interest to that book or even, you know, content interest to that book that makes it worth saving. Uh, is it rare or unusual? This is a little bit harder for family archives. Like, you know, grandma only wrote so many letters, so everything is technically rare. Um, but is it something that's really rare in the sense that, you know, these five letters from grandma really are different. She talks very candidly about her relationship with grandpa or something like that um, versus I've got 15, 20 letters that are really just very boring minutia of her life. So, you know, think about highlighting those things then or maybe not saving all 15 of the other letters, making some compromises there. Does it directly connect to an event topic or person that is of interest? So I usually think of that one in terms of what kind of life events was my family member living through? Um, you know, World War II letters are, are a big part of our archives at Grand Valley. So are these letters showing a different side of that experience of living through that time? Did that person keep a journal of their experience living through COVID-19 pandemic? Like maybe we keep that thing, um, those sorts of direct uh, tie-ins. Again, that uh, uh, point of evidence, does it provide evidence of what life was like at that time period or how a business operated, how it survived during a difficult time period and anything like that? Again, legal financial obligation to save some things. And then finally, if it's in good physical condition, that can be a reason to save it. If it's just in really nice shape and it's something that um, you know is even tangentially related to grandma, um, you might feel differently than if it's something that's really decayed and gross. All right, and we'll talk more about um, condition as we go on too. All right, so what about not keeping? I've been framing this in my head as the, uh, the don't save the purple paper exercise um, because of uh, a particular exercise Annie and I ran with some young professionals once. We asked them to sort through a box of archival collection materials and talk about how they would organize, save, or discard what was in this box. And not one of them wanted to throw away the blank purple paper that I had thrown in on a whim. And it just really like was a light bulb moment for me that this was very difficult for people not used to doing archival work to think about why they don't need to save something, that it can just be a different kind of mindset. So you don't need to save everything. There are different reasons we might not save something. Uh, another example and sort of the knee-jerk response most archivists give to the question of what do you not save is receipts. They usually don't have a ton of value. Think about you know, the receipt from Meyer that says you bought bread and milk. Is that really telling a story or providing evidence of anything other than the fact that you bought the basics? Not really. Um, so for the most part, we don't save receipts. Um, we don't ask for them for sure. But there might be some special cases where there's a lot of context around a receipt that makes it special. You know, your great, great grandpa immigrated to America and this is the receipt from the very first item he bought on American soil. And there's more to that story that you can tell around that receipt suddenly that receipt gets more value. Uh, same with if you have like a whole drawer full of receipts that show how your community uh, business, your mom and pop shop or whatever operated over 50 years. Um, that can be really valuable. You might not need to save every single one of them, but it's telling a much broader story than that one Meyer receipt. Um, so thinking about context around stuff, uh, if the value is not evident, if it, you just can't fit it into one of those value types we talked about, probably not worth saving. Um, again, you can't figure out the story around it. It's just a random button you found in grandma's shoebox. You're not sure about it. Just, it's a good candidate to get rid of. If it's in poor condition, so especially things that are moldy, that mold will transfer to other materials. So you're risking most of your collection, if not all of it, by hanging on to that one thing. Is it worth it? Probably not, especially if we can change its format. So if we can scan it, digitize it, um, things Annie will talk more about later. Don't save duplicates. Um, I recommend no more than two copies of anything. Um, definitely not more than that, uh, typically necessary. If it's poor quality, like uh, a newspaper where you, it's not really legible, the printing's not great on it, uh, a photograph that's super blurry and you can't identify the people, don't save it. And then 
the purple paper, get rid of unused items. If it's blank and it hasn't been used, you don't know why grandma kept it, don't, don't you keep it then. Um, another example of this we see a lot is like memo pads, uh, particularly when we do office transfers. Someone kept this on their desk. It's just the note paper they used all the time. You don't need to save the memo pad. Maybe you like the letterhead on it is interesting. You could save one sheet of it, but you don't need to save the whole thing as archival. All right. And then think about the long-term impacts of what you're saving. So one of the challenges here um, when we're dealing with family and community materials is often embarrassment. So we've all got uh, sort of that one family member who embarrasses us, or perhaps we don't agree with, or we don't get along with in some way. So I'm going to call that family member Uncle Harry. And let's say we have a portion of letters that are just all about Uncle Harry being Uncle Harry and his black sheep, horrible family way, whatever that means to you. It might be really tempting to take that section of the collection and just casually add that to the discard pile because Uncle Harry is embarrassing. You don't want people to know about Uncle Harry. Um, and so I think that's kind of problematic. As archivists, we want you to push back against that. It's actually, it can be really unethical, <laughs> as a matter of fact, to just try to hide the parts that are embarrassing to you. Um, that's a judgment call that can be really hard to make. Um, but think about it then in a broader context, right? If we look at the history of America, and if we just shoved all the embarrassing parts to the side, we wouldn't have a very realistic picture of America. Uh, and so that's kind of what history has been doing for the last, you know, however many years, trying to add some of those maybe more embarrassing stories back into history textbooks, but providing context around them, right? So um, I encourage you to think about saving Uncle Harry's embarrassing letters and doing some other things with them instead. So some things that you can do. If you're giving to an archival institution, you can consider closing those records for a, a, a period of time. You can negotiate that with an archivist and saying like, maybe let's wait until Uncle Harry has passed on so he can't be personally uh, embarrassed by this. But you know, 50, 100 years from now, we don't care if people know about Uncle Harry. They don't have that same personal connection to him that I do right now. Another thing you can do if you're keeping things within the family is just to write some context notes about your relationship with Harry. You know, explain your perspective. That, that can be its own account that gets added into a folder, put in your box. Uh, and just provide some context about like maybe, um, you know, why you kept the letters, why you felt like you wanted to discard them but didn't, um, document that decision, all that kind of stuff, um, just to add more layers to Uncle Harry's story. If you're working in a community archive, you want to think about privacy concerns. Uh, for example, we don't keep records with students' personal information on them. That's their private information. Um, we sometimes see resumes from previous employees that will include things like their social security number or their height and their weight information and we don't we don't want that that's private to them it doesn't really help tell us anything about their employee status at Grand Valley. Uh, and then again, always keep in mind legal considerations, if you need to prove to a reporting body that you were operating legally do make sure you are um, keeping those records and that you know what those records are and how long you need to save them for. All right, I'm gonna move us into our next section, which is talking about organizing. You've sort of made your decisions about um, saving or not saving. How do you categorize and then keep, keep what you want? And sometimes these decisions um, or these two processes are done sort of together. They're not step one, step two, quite like I've organized them. Um, but for purposes of this presentation, I thought it was easier to talk about it this way. So first of all, when you're going through materials, you wanna make sure you have a designated space to work in. Uh, I'm going to promise you it's going to look really bad when you get started and then it will get better. Um, it's impossible to not make a mess while, while doing this kind of organizing or what we call processing work. Um, so then once you've gotten started, you kind of pulled all your material out, you're ready to get going. I want you to think simple, simplify your mindset. So it can be super overwhelming. You go into grandma's house and you need to clear out her, you know, her whole closet that has 50 photo albums or 300 letters or, you know, every last piece of paper that her kids uh, drew on, whatever. Um, if we think about it like that, it can feel really mentally overwhelming. And so a trick that I like to use is instead of thinking of that, we think we have one collection of grandma's photo albums. We have one collection of grandma's letters. We have one collection from Uncle Harry, whatever. Um, so if we think about it in those big senses, uh, that big collection term, instead of each individual item, it can just be a nice um, mindset adjustment into how you're looking at, at everything is sort of going together as a unit. 
Um, my next tip, clumps are your friend. Annie tells me that as an archivist, I should call them piles. So clumps or piles, whatever your preference, they are your friends. So as you, you're gonna make your mess by making these clumps. Um, as, you just, as you go through stuff, you want to try to categorize it into different piles. Um, and that can be, you know, your photo album, here's my photo album pile, here's my letter pile, it can be here's my family photo album pile, here's my vacation trip uh, photo album pile, here's my chronological sorting of letters, what however you want to categorize it. Uh, that's fine. Start big, start broad, refine it as you go. That's fine. But start making those piles and sorting your materials together. This is the only time I will recommend post-it notes. They are my preferred method to write my clump labels. It is really important you do not stick the post-it note actually on the materials, just in the vicinity of your clump, um, because post-it notes will damage materials. So it's just a way to help you remember if this, this is most likely going to be a long-term project. If you walk away and come back, you don't want to look at your piles and go, uh, what was I doing again? Because that's going to waste a lot of your time having to restart over. Uh, and remember, oh yeah, this pile was the year 1850, and this pile was the year 1870, whatever. Uh, try to make fast judgments as you go. Um, this is a little bit dependent on your own personal context. So if you stop and savor every single item that you have, um, you're not you're not going to move along too fast. So if you um, are concerned about time, you want to get the project done, don't do that. If you're using this in a, as a family, as a cathartic experience or bonding time between you and your siblings or you and your children, uh, you might feel differently. You might want to take more time with each item and talk about it or um, read it fully. That's kind of your judgment call for the most part, though I try to say, you know, move a little bit faster, don't read everything. Um, go with your gut instinct. Put it in your the first clump that really works for you. And then don't second guess yourself. Now that might change. You might realize as you go, oh, there should be this category because this piece of paper and this piece of paper really make more sense in this one spot. And that's fine. But for the most part, try not to second guess yourself because that opens you up to sort of that indecision bug where you're just like, I, I can't, I don't trust my own judgment anymore. And it becomes more emotional and um, just harder to do. And then finally, it's never going to be perfect. I'm here to just kill that dream right now. It's not going to be perfect. Um, decide what's going to be good enough for you and then move on, leave it at that stage. Um, you can always go back and refine it later if you have time or willpower to do that. Um, but even in archives, you know, I might have processed something, a collection, and then, you know, 20 years from now, another archivist is going to come in and say that, you know, this wasn't the best way and I'm going to reorganize it a different way. That's totally normal. Um, but it makes it not a good use of my time to try to get perfection when the next person coming in is going to see perfection differently anyway. Other tips for organizing, uh, try to keep like materials with like materials. Annie will talk more about that um, kind of preservation aspect of it, but uh, basically if you keep all your photos together or your newspapers together, they're less likely to damage other things around them. Keep materials from the same source together. You know, if you go into your family attic and you have all of grandma's stuff in one spot, all of Uncle Harry's stuff in one spot, and all of Aunt Lucy's stuff in another spot, Keep those collections separate. This is grandma's collection. This is Uncle Harry's collection. This is Aunt Lucy's collection. How those records relate together um, means something or can mean something. And it's just really confusing once you start introducing multiple creators and multiple storylines into one spot. So I just recommend just keep them separate based on who they came from, who created the collection. Keep materials in order if it makes sense to do so. So maybe grandma was really good at organizing and she already kind of had her photo albums set up in a specific way. That's great. You can keep that and run with it so long as it makes sense. But if, you know, Uncle Harry gives you the garbage bag of letters that you have to dump out to even see, there's no organization system already in place. So you can feel free to decide to do whatever with that collection, you know, make it make sense however it makes sense to you. All right. And finally, keep in mind that the end result is theoretically that other people are going to use the materials and not just you. It might just be you for a while, but it should be set up so that other people can use it too. The best way to, to really make a collection usable is to keep a collection inventory. So once you have everything organized and set up in boxes, make a, make a Word document, make a spreadsheet, whatever you're comfortable with, and write an inventory. You know, box one has grandma's letters to grandpa from a, you know, 1944 to 19... 90, whatever. Um, but make sure you have some kind of list of everything in those boxes 
it's going to make it easier for people to use the collection. It's also going to help document your decision making. And it's also going to protect you when Aunt Lucy comes back and accuses you of having gotten rid of her baby pictures because you never liked her anyway. And you can say, oh, wait, nope, that wasn't in grandma's stuff to begin with. Maybe she got rid of your baby pictures, you know, so you can kind of head off Aunt Lucy's temper right there. And then think about how will the collection be used? Should you look into scanning things and sharing them online? Should you make the boxes available in an office space for your community members to come in and view? Um, who's gonna be using it? Is it for your relatives? Do you wanna give it to an archival institution at some point? What are you thinking? And what will those people need to know to use the collection effectively? So think about context in particular. Um, it's so rare for us to get photos that actually tell us who the people in the photo are. And it makes such a big difference um, when you're trying to understand the collection and figure out who are all the players in the story. If we can put a face to the name, um, it's just super helpful. Label DVDs, this, you know, this is Lucy Bell's first ballet performance. Um, apparently Lucy is my go-to fake name there. Um, make a family tree so we know how all the people are related in your story. Um, anything that will provide more context and information about what they're looking at will help future researchers, future relatives, be able to, to really look at and focus on the materials and the story. So that's all for me. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that Annie can take over and talk to us um, about the rest. Okay. Give me one moment here while I am getting adjusted. All right, share that, present mode. Okay, so I'm taking the reins here to talk about preservation and how to sort of lengthen the sort of lifespan of an item or collection in its original form or sort of as close to that as possible. Preservation is sometimes confused with conservation. Um, and those are sort of the activity, conservation is the activities that mend or repair or replace parts of a damaged item. Whereas preservation are those strategies um, that, that you know, you're, you're doing to sort of mitigate future harm to the collection. So archivists don't actually perform a lot of conservation or mending, repairing archives because those activities are extremely painstaking um, and we usually just have too much stuff. Um, to be able to do that kind of work. And it's its own sort of discipline. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing again on preservation today um, and, uh, and preventing future harm. Okay, so most things are going to last a while if you follow these kind of basic principles. And I'm gonna go into those into a little bit more detail here in a second. Um, they are do no harm, handle with care, keep it dry, store in cool, dark places, avoid pests and pollution, and use good archival housing. So do no harm. In a lot of ways, this is kind of an overarching principle. And what we really mean by this is try not to do anything to the materials that can't be undone. Don't make any permanent changes. So this is gonna include kind of um, things like not using permanent pens, highlighters, or markers when you're working with your archives, and instead using things like pencils. Now they do make special archival pens for marking on um, like plastic DVDs or um, for the backs of photographs, but um, for most things, you're gonna wanna stick with pencils that can be erased. And when you are writing, you wanna be careful not to press too hard and make like really deep indentations on any paper materials that you're working with. Additionally, you want to avoid any kind of adhesives, glues, scotch tape, masking tape, post-it notes, anything like that. Um, you want to avoid those while, while you're working with archives. Um, as Lee mentioned, you can put your uh, post-it notes next to your clumps but not on top of your clumps. Uh, yeah, I like to call them piles. <laughs> I actually tend to use just scrap paper um, and write a note about what my pile is and set it on top of the pile. But you know, when you're walking around, things can um, blow off or you know, your cat can get involved in the situation and, and mess that up. So post-it notes are okay, stick it next to the pile. Um, those adhesives, um, they can leave residues that get sticky. They can, um, some like glues can actually attract pests and we'll talk a little bit more about pests in a minute. Um, but they just cause more problems than they solve um, over the long term. So we just want to avoid that. 
And finally, you want to avoid fasteners or binders of any kind. So we want to avoid paper clips, staples, binder clips, even three ring binders. Um, the metals and those things can rust um, or they can sort of snag and tear things. Um, three ring binders are notorious for like the bindings getting um, uh, crooked. And then when you flip pages, then it just gets torn. Um, Rubber bands you also want to avoid. The rubber will dry out over time, and especially if they are wrapping around paper materials, that um, that like stuck on rubber bands, you have to scrape them off, and then you're causing damage to the original materials, and it's just a mess. So avoid binders um, and and fasteners and rubber bands. So the next principle is handle with care. And this can seem like a no-brainer, but we are often reminding archival visitors and our student employees to handle materials carefully. So this is gonna include things just like washing your hands before you handle archival material that'll get rid of any dirt, oils, and frankly, in COVID days, you're good, you're good washing your hands frequently anyway. So we're getting a little bit more used to that. Um, if you are handling photographic materials like prints or negatives or metal materials, um, I can recommend wearing gloves and preferably something like nitro gloves where you can kind of grip and you can feel through the gloves a little bit more easily. We actually avoid cotton gloves. So often when you see like a documentary and they're handling archival materials, see them with white cotton gloves. We actually, those are not okay for most archival materials, especially paper. Paper can get very brittle and then those cotton gloves can catch the they can tear, they can break pieces off. So um, if you do feel like you need gloves, stick with something like nitrile or latex if you, if you can um, tolerate that. Um, but you know, most of the time you don't really need gloves unless you are trying to prevent fingerprints on like photo prints or negatives or something like that. You always want to work with a clean workspace. So, you know, if you're organizing your materials, just get rid of anything that you don't need to work on right now. Um, you know, dust it off, brush it, brush any debris away. You just want to avoid um, anything that is going to potentially damage your your materials or just get um, get messed up. No food or drinks. So don't don't drink coffee while you're working with archival materials. Um, that's just always a good rule of thumb. You know, there's always a risk of spilling uh, and getting that stuff into your materials. And then, of course, that's a permanent change. Um, you can attract pests. It's just a bad idea to have food or drinks around your archives. Um, while you're working with archives, you want to keep things, for the most part, flat on your work surface. So. Um, you know, if you're actively moving things around and putting them in piles, that's one thing. But if you're actually like sitting there and reading something, you want it to be well supported by the surface that you're working on um, so that, you know, things are not getting bent or damaged or folded. Um, and finally, you want to always carry archival boxes with both hands. So using both hands on a box is just going to sort of trigger your brain to be more careful, to think about where you're going, what, like what you're touching, um, where your feet are, um, and you just want to be careful while you're, um, while you're carrying archival material so that you, you know, reduce the risk of dropping or breaking or what have you. So now I'm going to move into a little bit of um, storage recommendations for helping to preserve the length uh, that your archives are, um, are available um, for reuse. So water, keep them dry. Um, water and moisture can um, really damage archives. Um, in addition to sort of the physical damage of, of just getting wet and yucky and then drying out, you also are risks, you risk staining from water or other liquids and uh, liquids and water can wash out inks and pigments and then you lose that information that was written there. So you wanna be careful about that. And then the big one Lee has mentioned a couple of times is mold. So we really want to prevent mold as much as possible. Mold, um, once, there, it, once you have an outbreak, it can spread really fast and it can destroy your archives. And all kinds of archival materials are susceptible to mold. Um, and, and not only is mold dangerous for your archives, but it's also often hazardous to your health. So we just wanna prevent it as much as possible. 
So your strategies here for avoiding, um, for keeping your archives dry is just to store them away from sources of water. So pipes or sinks, you know, if you're choosing a storage location, think about, you know, is this closet that I want to put the stuff in, is it um, right underneath my second floor bathroom? That's probably not a very good storage location because if there was an overflow or a pipe were to burst, that water could come down and get on your materials and potentially destroy them or damage them. Conversely, you want to store your archives at least six inches off the floor. So in case there is a, a, a leak or a flood of some kind, six inches is a good rule of thumb and it's the and it's kind of the standard that we use in our archives. Now, if you have a big flood and it comes up higher than that, you know, we realize that that is a is always a potential, but you really want to think about, you know, if you're in kind of a, a floodplain or something like that, you know, you may want to raise that up even higher than six inches, but six inches is kind of our good rule of thumb. And this last one, this one can get tricky. Um, if you if you are a home archivist, a, you know, a family archivist, but if you do have a more sophisticated um, HVAC system, you know, at your disposal, you also want to keep an eye on the relative humidity of your storage space. Um, we like to keep relative humidity around 50%. So 50% is, is fairly dry, but it's not too dry. Um, that kind of dry humidity is going to help inhibit mold growth. So um, again, we're talking about just preventing that from happening in the first place. Uh, the next thing that you want to do is to store your materials in cool, dark places. So high temperatures um, and light can cause physical damage. They can accelerate the natural rate of decay of um, your materials. And light can actually cause fading or sunburn of materials. And you can see here in this picture, this is an archival box that has been sitting under probably fairly bright lights or, or even dim lights for a long time. And you can see that box has bleach where, um, where the lid has closed, it retains that dark gray color, but where it's been exposed to light, it's almost, it's faded almost to this pink color. Now, luckily all of the archival materials in this box have probably, um, are probably not bleached because they weren't exposed to the light, which is why we put things in boxes. Uh, well, one of the reasons why we put things in boxes. But um, but again, light, uh, UV in particular, um, can really damage and fade um, archival materials. So uh, we want to avoid that. So when you're storing, you want to think about um, uh, storing things indoors, in air conditioning, a cool room temperature is, is really good for archives. We keep our archives around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Some archives storage places can um, can go quite a bit lower. So, um, but that's often, often not very comfortable for people. So, you know, if you're storing these things in your home, you want to aim for a kind of a, a, a pretty steady cool room temperature. You don't want to store it in a place where the temperature is going to fluctuate a lot out throughout the year. Um, and this combines sort of those, those temperature fluctuations combined with um, humidity fluctuations can really damage archives um, very quickly even. Um, and so you don't want a storage location like an attic a garage, an outdoor shed, um, or even a basement if you uh, experience those um, temperature and humidity fluctuations throughout the year. In addition, you don't want to store things in direct light. Um, you want you know, to have them contained. If you have something where you want to put it on display, even um, like UV filtered glass or plastic, if it's in sort of direct sunlight, that glass can create heat behind there if it's in direct light and then that heat can, can cause damage. So you just wanna be mindful of where you're storing these things um, and, and keep them cool and dry. You also want to avoid pests and pollution. So pests, there are lots of different kinds and it varies regionally. Um, you know, we're talking about insects, mice, other little critters that like to eat or chew on archives and then create a mess. So not only are they potentially destroying the materials, they're also leaving a mess behind and that's just gross. You don't wanna encounter that. Um, I've encountered a lot of dead bug bodies <laughs> over my career and uh, trust me, it's gross. So you want to store them away from sources of like food or other materials that might attract pests and like get, you know, get them in there. Um, and again, you don't wanna eat or drink while you're handling the materials. 
You also want to avoid sources of pollution. So things like dust, um, smoke, um, car exhaust, those kinds of things, those kind of chemically things in the air that um, can, again, accelerate that rate of decay in the materials. Also, your archives can absorb those smells. Um, can also be a source of pollution. So you think about, you know, um, cats or, uh, you know, you don't you want your archive smelling like cats. That's gross. Um, <laughs> so you don't want it. You want to avoid those things as much as possible. Um, so again, you do not want to store them in your garage where you park your car and maybe you store your gas lawnmower. You know, those smells can soak into your um, your archives and those chemicals can um, can accelerate the decay. And finally, you want to use good archival housing. And when I say housing, I'm really talking about the containers, the boxes, the folders, the sleeves, et cetera, that you are storing your archival materials in. So poor housing can actually cause damage to archives as well. So if you're thinking about like a sealed um, Rubbermaid or plastic container, you can actually trap humidity in your archives and that humidity can cause your photos to stick together or it can, um, you know, accelerate um, how quickly those things are naturally going to deteriorate. Um, so you want to be careful about that. Additionally, if you are like reusing boxes, you want to be careful about choosing boxes that didn't have anything like chemically or, or odorous in there that can then again transfer into your archives. And you want to be really careful about acid. So a lot of cardboards and papers are highly acidic due to the um, like the the content of wood pulp in them. And that acid can actually damage particularly paper materials, but other materials over time. So there's this picture here at the bottom um, of an evidence, evidence of acid burn, and that's a piece of newspaper, which is a highly acidic paper tucked into a book. And that acid eats into the, to the other paper, and that's permanent. You can't undo that. And that will continue to accelerate the decay in that spot um, over time, especially if you leave that newspaper clipping in there. So get that out of there. Um, separate it from, um, from other materials. Um, and don't use boxes that are highly acidic. So strategies again here are just to uh, purchase good archival boxes, folders, and sleeves from a reputable vendor. And I am going to share some of those uh, vendors that I recommend here in the next slide. You also want to use the correct size housing for the contents that you are um, that you're working with. So in the in the the picture here below, you can see you've got a box that's um, that's got you know it's a it's a legal size box and it's got letter size materials in it. Well, if you're moving that box around, those materials are going to shift around in there and potentially the stuff inside will get damaged. So you want to be careful and mindful about how big your box is and how, how big your stuff is. You don't want your, your stuff packed into a box that's too small and you don't want your stuff um, unsupported inside a box that's too large. Uh, when you're sort of storing them on the shelves or what have you, you don't want to stack your boxes up too high. Even boxes with reinforced edges can only hold so much on the exterior. So you just want to be mindful about crushing damage and that kind of thing as well. When you are putting your materials inside of an archival box, you want to make sure that the materials inside are well supported. And um, because if they're not, if you like, if your box is underfilled, over time, those um, those papers inside will actually kind of slump over, and this is especially prevalent with like uh, photos and paper documents. Those will slump over, and then that curve becomes basically semi permanent. And photos, especially, can be really um, difficult to work with if if they have that curve in them. So you want to be mindful of that. So you know you want to put enough material in that everything inside is supported, but you don't want to overfill a box so that you can't actually easily get stuff in and out. So that's something to keep. In in mind. And folders, you know, they make archival folders and that can really help you to kind of keep things grouped together in your clumps. Once you've figured out what your clumps are, you folder them together into a file and, um, and those, uh, those folders can help to, to provide that support as well. Okay, so archival supplies, they are more expensive than just regular boxes and folders. But if we're if you're serious about you know preserving these things for the long run, you're gonna want to um, to make that investment. So um, some of these companies that I have listed here 
are, um, are the ones that you're going to want to look at. So Hollinger Metal Edge, University Products, and Gaylord Archival are three um, companies that I purchase archival materials from regularly. They all have kind of very similar things. Um, you can get better deals on different kinds of things from one versus the other. Um, so you can check out all of those websites um, and look for archival housing. Oh, I forgot to mention something. I'm gonna go back a slide. <laughs> Excuse me. I do wanna mention plastic sleeves. I almost forgot about this, it's very important. Um, if you are using plastic sleeves for your photographs, your negatives, um, other kinds of memorabilia, postcards, what have you, you want to look for plastic that has passed the PAT, and that stands for Photographic Activity Test. And that testing has been done to determine whether plastics are chemically stable in the presence of photographic chemicals. So um, plastics like polyester and polyethylene are chemically stable and they are commonly used in archives. Uh, polyester you may see also called mylar, that's like the brand name. But if you are looking for sleeves, you want to look for PAT sleeves and any good um, archival vendor is going to have that listed on their, on their catalog or in their website. So again, those archival vendors, Hollinger Metal Edge, University Products, Gaylord Archival, Page Company is another company that has mostly boxes and they have really thick double walled archival acid free boxes that you can use if you have like bigger materials or a lot of stuff. Um, it's just important to keep in mind that those larger boxes, if they are um, full of paper, they will get very heavy. I mean, one of those, uh, you know, one of those banker boxes, if it's completely full, can weigh, you know, 40 pounds. So that's something to keep um, in mind as you are thinking about how is this stuff going to be stored and used in the future? You know, am I expecting, you know, me as I get older to be able to pull it off of a, of a, of a high shelf? You might want to think about storing in smaller boxes if you have a lot of uh, heavy, heavy material like paper or photographs. Okay, so I know some of you are probably thinking, well, what do I do with these stuck together photos? And what do I do with the scrapbook with all kinds of newspaper clippings falling out of it? And what do I do with these, you know, this broken hard drive? How do I get my data out? Unfortunately, we do not have time today to go into all of the details. Uh, we are going to share um, a document that we put together with some resources if you want to do some more in-depth research, or um, we may be able to have some time here at the end to um, field your questions, but I can see that I am running a little long. So I'm going to move it along and start to talk about digital archives. Um, and this is another really big topic. I wish that I could go into more detail. But what I'm going to talk about with digital um, archives is digitization. And then I'm going to talk about digital decay. And then I want to talk about some um, digital preservation strategies that you can take to, to preserve your data. So digitization is a great option um, to, uh, to preserve the contents of old or obsolete media or materials that are falling apart. Um, it's also a great way to be able to share your archival materials with friends and family or the general public. For long-term use, it's important that you digitize carefully. Um, and it's also important that you save master files in uncompressed format. Uncompressed formats are things like TIFF files for images, WAV files for audio, MOV or AVI files for video. These uncompressed files take up a lot more space in your, um, in your storage, but they also retain a lot of data. And that data is gonna be really critical to maintaining these things long-term. And we say long-term, long-term in digital years is like five years, that's a long time. but archives, you know, we want to, we want to save things for 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, like we really want to be careful about how we're saving things. So it's something that's important for you, um, sort of as a citizen archivist to think about too, if you're digitizing, save those uncompressed file formats. Now you can use those uncompressed file formats to create compressed file formats that are then a lot easier to share and stream. So those, uh, those compressed file formats are things like JPEGs or PNG images, um, MP3 audio files, MP4 video files. Those compressed file formats, they use algorithms to, to reduce the amount of data in the files. 
But over time, uh, that compression as the as you make copies or move them around, which is just making more copies, um, that compression happens over and over and over again. So you want to be careful because that will cause a digital decay. If there is any, while you're digitizing, if there's any contextual information on the original item, so you've got a VHS tape and it's got a label on it, you want to copy that information and save it with the digital file so that you know what the thing is, you know, and that can just look like, you know, an inventory. You can just create a text document that goes along with all of the digital images or the digital uh, media that you're creating. Um, and you want to save that information to help, you know, yourself remember or, you know, your, um, your kids when they come to these things. Uh, know what those things are. And you always want to retain the originals for as long as you can. So this might seem counterintuitive, but the truth is, is technology is always getting better. So, you know, you may have uh, already digitized your VHS tapes and you had somebody put them on CDs. Well, now your CD is not readable because it got scratched. What are you going to do, right? Well, you still have those VHS tapes. You can get them digitized again if they're still in good enough shape. Um, Maybe you can even get a better copy and maybe you can put it on media that is less liable to get damaged or scratched. So hang on to those originals for as long as it makes sense. Now, if it's moldy or if it's posing a risk to other materials, you definitely want to get rid of it. But for the most part, you want to hang on to the originals. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about digital decay and sort of copying and how that can um, cause damage over time. I'm going to talk about a couple different kinds of digital decay things to keep in mind while you are uh, working with digital materials. Um, because digital materials, they do decay, just like physical materials. It looks a little bit different, but it definitely happens. So bit rot is something that happens when files are copied over and over again or moved around over and over again. And the ones and zeros, the, the little bits of information that make up that file, change, they get changed, they get corrupted. And if it happens over and over again, you, you end up with a, a file that is unrenderable, that's too corrupt. And you can see um, this image of this little boy, um, that, is, uh, that is bit rot that you can see there on an image and it makes the file, you know, the image you can't really even tell what it is at the end. Storage media obsolescence is another kind of digital, uh, digital decay. This happens when the, um, the media that your content is stored on um, becomes technologically obsolete. So we're thinking about like floppy disks or, or zip disks, right? Like we used to use those to store all of our digital content on almost. And now you don't, you can't use them anymore because our computers don't even have floppy drives. You have to buy those special. They, they do still make them, but uh, it's a lot harder to access that. That technology is obsolete. Physical media decay also happens. And that, of course, happens when your physical medium, like a floppy disk or a CDR or a hard drive, gets physically damaged. And then the data on there is corrupted or unreadable. So, you know, CDs get scratched. You can drop a hard drive and, and, and damage the disk inside. Um, that kind of uh, risk is there as well. File format obsolescence also happens. Um, this is when um, the original file format can't be read by current software. Every piece of um, digital information um, has to be rendered by a computer, and that computer has to have the right information to be able to render those files. Um, so uh, that's just something to keep in mind. File formats do become obsolete. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about here is um, like word perfect files. Back in the 90s, everybody used like a lot of people, we used WordPerfect, and now nobody uses WordPerfect. And so we have to update those files to something like a PDF or a Word file so that we can actually use that content. And finally, link rot. This is um, something that happens on the internet because the internet is not static. Every file page um, image that's on the internet has to be maintained. And when those files, um, when those pages are not maintained, the links to those pages break. So that's something just to keep in mind that um, if you're creating some kind of document that has links out to the internet, those links will break eventually. Trust me on that one. So some digital preservation strategies, I, I realize that we're getting close to the end here, um, that you can do. So digital preservation can get really complicated when you're working at a large scale with lots of different kinds of files. But if what you have is a small amount of materials or um, you know, files in a few simple like common um, file formats like TIFFs and JPEGs and PDFs and that kind of thing, um, you can follow these um, yourself. So, 
Principle one is lots of copies keeps stuff safe, locks, that's the principle. And what we're really talking about here is redundant storage. So you want to keep multiple copies of your archives, your digital archives in more than one place. Maybe you have it on a flash drive at home. Maybe you give a copy to your sister. Maybe you put a copy of it on a, on a, into a cloud storage service like Google Drive or Amazon. Um, those services are actually pretty easy to use and can be very affordable. And so those are a good option um, to, to create a redundant backup of your archives. As file formats become obsolete, you also want to think about migrating those. So from time to time, you may want to go revisit your master copies, those uncompressed file formats, and render a new up-to-date version of you know, an uncompressed file format that's more up-to-date or um, a compressed file format um, that you can stream or share easily that's just more up-to-date and more commonly used in the time. So um, you know, again, you know, we used to use WordPerfect files a lot and, um, and now we don't use them at all. So file migration is something that you will need to do over time as you're working with these things. And so I know you're probably thinking, well, what about social media? Can't I just put it on Facebook and call it a day? Um, social media, <laughs> you know, we're talking here about Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, Flickr, YouTube, TikTok, all of the other ones that, um, that exist out there. There are pros and cons to using social media. Um, they're great for sharing. They're great for creating, remixing, and reusing content. Um, but they can have very confusing and restrictive terms of service. So that's something that you want to be careful about while you're thinking about putting stuff in social media. Um, and also, you know, due to the way that social media apps work, when you put things in them, you give up a lot of control over what you put into them. Um, your files are going into their servers, or maybe they're created on their servers. They may not be in a file format that you can do anything with. They may have their file names changed. And um, particularly with like Facebook and Instagram, they compress those images considerably. And so um, what you actually can get out of Facebook is not going to be as good as what you put in. So just be mindful of that. Um, and finally, you know, uh, it can be difficult and sometimes even impossible to remove or delete things from social media platforms. So just you know, keep in mind that what you put out there um, is out there. You can't stop people from copying it. You can't stop people from downloading it um, in most cases. And so you just wanna think about that um, before you are sharing your, your archives and social media. Not to say you can't, just think of it as an imperfect backup. You know, what you put in is probably, or what you get out is probably not going to be as good as what you put in. Um, and so you probably want to make sure that you have a sort of master backup and multiple copies of it somewhere else. Okay, so we are almost at time. Um, I think I'm going to unshare my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Uh, here we go, stop share and turn it over to Kim. All right, thank you so much. And my apologies for not announcing at the beginning that both this webinar is being recorded and it's going to be available later on this week as well as to use the Q&A chat box. This of course had to be the first time I forgot to say that at the start of the webinar. So thank you so much to our kind panelists and just Lee and Annie, thank you so much for bringing your wealth of knowledge here today. We did receive some questions in the chat. I'm hoping that we might be able to get to all of them but we may not. Um, so I just want to let you know, uh, we're also going to plop two things in the chat. One is a list of resources that Annie referenced, and then the other one will be the survey that we hope that you guys can um, complete about this event. But first, um, I, hopefully this is going to be a couple short sort of answers, and then we can get sort of into a, like end with a lot uh, like a more broad question. Um, so obviously COVID times, people are using hand sanitizer. What feelings about how hand sanitizer is being used in relation to handling archival materials. Um, do you have any sort of best practices or a piece of advice? Yeah, so um, we actually looked into this ourselves um, at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, most archival um, or preservation specialists do not recommend using hand sanitizer right before you handle archival materials, um, just because of the high alcohol content and like the aloe vera and different kinds of chemicals that are in those. You're better off just washing your hands with soap right before you use archival material. So, um, you know, it's good to think about, you know, where have my hands been? Maybe I'm dirty. 
probably, I mean, if in the, you know, in the absence of soap and water, hand sanitizer is okay, but it's actually not going to reduce the oils and stuff that are on your hands. It's not going to actually clean your hands. It's just going to sanitize them. So soap and water recommended hand sanitizer, not so much. Thank you. No, that's really helpful. Um, somebody asked, is interested in recording their family history. They initially plan on doing video recordings, but as you were chatting about thinking about digital preservation, they're, they're not sure, right? And so, you know, is there a certain way or any kinds of recommendations that you may have if you still wanted to have those video recordings, any other best practices or should they be doing something else? You definitely can record. I mean, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to. You know, make people think that they can't record them. It's just good to be mindful of the actual work that goes into preserving digital copies because you do have to take care of them just as much as you have to take care of physical copies. And digital materials can actually be quite quite a bit more ephemeral um, or you know disappear e more easily than physical things can. So um, as uh, CDs and DVDRs in particular um, are becoming Coming obsolete, you know, my my laptop does not have a DVD drive in it. Um, those things are going to disappear pretty soon, and so I don't recommend using like a DVD or other kind of optical disc as a storage medium for video. Um, but if you if you have a good strategy, you know, you have a good place, um, a plan in place to to care for digital materials. Video recordings are great. If you're if you're hesitant to do that, you know, you can always um, like make an audio recording and then transcribe it. You know, you can write down those stories. Paper is actually really easy to care for, and most. Um, commercially available paper is these days is actually pretty um, good when it comes to like that acid um, quality. Um, you can always buy archival acid free paper if you really want to be careful about it um, and record those stories that way. Um, we, we've figured out paper. Digital, we're still working on, but but the paper go to. <laughs> So I also just want to just be quick and be mindful of time. So I'm going to only ask uh, a couple more questions, if that's okay with Lee and Annie. Um, so this question is directed sort of at what Lee was saying at the beginning of the presentation. Lee, you mentioned resumes, right, may have um, personally identifiable information that should not be preserved, but yet maybe you want to preserve other aspects of a resume. Is there a way to do that? Um, do you have any recommendations for how that can be done so you're maintaining privacy, right, but also preserving information? You can redact the information that you think is private. Um, you have to be careful about doing that to make sure you've actually obscured it fully. Um, you can make a photocopy, um, you know, where you block off uh, the parts that are not relevant and just make a copy of the relevant part and keep that file instead of the original. Um, depending on what the original format was. I'm assuming it's just a paper document if it's a resume. Um, those are my quickest thoughts about it. There might be a more intense way, um, but I would probably just settle for a photocopy that's blocked out um, dark paper over it um, so that you just get the relevant part, that kind of thing. Yeah, often when archives are redacting contents in their archives, just to, just to jump in here, sorry, Lee. Oh, <laughs> um, we will uh, keep the original that is unredacted just in case something changes about the kind of information that we are um, able to share. Um, so like we would never like mark out with a permanent marker, like the information on the original and then make the photocopy. We would probably make a photocopy use the pen on the photocopy and then make another photocopy of that photocopy um, so that we're preserving the informational content that we can share, um, but then still have that original with the full information. And so like government archives do that all the time, right? Like they, like when you get, if you, if you have an FBI file on you and you contact the FBI, they'll send you a redacted copy of that thing that redacts all of the classified information. Um, but they have the master copy that is unredacted because that's their job. Um, so yeah, that's redaction. Um, so this is going to be a storage question, then I'm going to just move on to our last question, just being mindful of time. Um, and so if you're thinking about preserving um, newspaper articles, is it better to, how would you store, is it better, I guess, to preserve the original newsprint, or should we also be making photocopies or printing down, printing the digital version, right, from newspapers, since so many of them have moved to online content. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Definitely. 
Newspaper clippings are probably my least favorite thing to come across in the archives um, because they are weird shapes. Um, the paper is terrible. They can damage other archival materials. Um, typically what we, if we have time, what we will do is make a photocopy of those clippings um, and, and actually discard the originals because the original format in newspaper, in the case of newspaper clippings, the original format is not necessarily the thing that we're trying to preserve to have evidence of how things were done in the past. Everybody knows what newspaper clippings are. There will be a time in the future where maybe people don't really know what newspapers were, but right for right now, what we're trying to preserve is the informational content. If you have an entire newspaper that you want to preserve because of its, um, you know, because it's more like a memento, that's kind of a different story. But if you have a lot of newspapers, um, even if they document, you know, historically significant events, those newspapers probably exist in an archive somewhere and they've probably been microfilmed and digitized and you may even be able to find them again online. So that's also something to think about is like things that were massively produced like newspapers and magazines probably already exist in an archive somewhere. You may not need to save it for um, you know, the wider posterity. If it has sentimental value as an object, you might wanna hang on to it. But keep in mind that newsprint is it will decay much faster than other kinds of materials because of that highly acidic nature. Um, and it has, this, it, it has this thing that we call inherent vice. It kind of just like eats itself over time because of that acid and that wood pulp that's in there. So um, newsprint, we often just make photocopies of the newsprint and save those photocopies. I guess, sorry, there's another question that seems a little bit similar. So I wanna just ask it really quickly. Um, what about folks who are holding on to letters? Um, either from family members or just they're in their broader collection. Do you keep the letters within the original envelopes? Are we worried about glue? Um, um, yeah, so we definitely love letters. Uh, I love letters. That's my favorite thing to find in the archives is to find and read other people's letters. <laughs> it's actually kind of why I became an archivist. Um, letters can be tricky. Um, we typically take items, take letters out of their original um, uh, envelopes. The glue from envelopes can be um, problematic. Sometimes like it's hard to actually even get letters out of envelopes if the glue has stuck to the letter that's inside. So you want to be really careful about that when you're um, when you're kind of un unsleeving or, or de-enveloping. Is that a word? I don't know. Your letters. Um, but that's what archival folders are for, right? Like you can keep the letters with their envelope. Um, you can take a piece of uh, like copy paper even or acid-free paper if you wanna get really jazzy with it and, and make a little um, folder and then keep letters and then put multiple little um, folders of, envel of envelopes and letters in your, in your bigger uh, archival folder in the box. So um, you can definitely keep letters with their envelopes um, but preferably not in their envelopes. And you usually want to unfold those um, letters so that the creasing can kind of like, it's easier to use and you don't, um, you're not weakening those creases. And I guess this comes from our final question, which actually was asked sort of toward the beginning of this webinar. So um, the person asks or write, wrote, uh, many people don't think of their own histories and experiences as important enough to archive. What do you tell those people about the social or cultural impacts of these archives? There really isn't any history to tell if we don't talk about ordinary people, right? Um, there's no understanding of what everyday life was like if we don't talk about ordinary people. Um, it's fine to know what the president was doing, but like that's such a high level, so far distant from what everyone else was living and doing and experiencing. And so I always say that there's the there's extraordinary value in ordinary things in archives. That's just sort of the, the baseline. And it, maybe you don't see it, um, but if you talk to somebody else about it, um, talk to an archivist or even just a, a friend or someone who, who didn't know um, this person well, if they can find something interesting about it, oh, that story about your grandma is so cool. I didn't know people, uh, you know, I didn't know life was like that then. That can signal enough value that, to be saved. Um, one example that I uh, tend to talk about was from an earlier archive I worked at. Um, who this, this woman um, had a baby during World War II and wrote very candidly about her mental health, which was extremely rare at the time. And I, I wouldn't di diagnose her on my own, I'm not that kind of medical professional, but it's such a candid look. And that's something that we don't see from that time period. Um, so anything that just feels really honest about life um, can have value, even if it's hard for you to see it um, or for that person to see it. If they, um, you know, you wanna record a history with them and like, oh, I don't have anything to say. 
Um, you say, yes, you do. If you have, if, you know, if you've lived through anything, <laughs> you've got something to say about it. So um, I, I very much think they should still contribute. <laughs> Agreed. You are important. Your family is important. <laughs> These stories are very important to, to Your stories. future researchers. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Well, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today, especially for, you know, staying on a little bit longer than I know we anticipated. I know I learned a lot. In fact, you made me think um, how I keep track of names and ages on photographs um, and how I keep track of a lot of the things sort of in my own home personal archive. So thank you for that. I know everybody else I'm sure has learned a ton. Um, and so just want to say, um, this again, the webinar will be available online later this week. And thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of the week. Thanks for hosting us. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks. Bye. Bye.